I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We're executive directors of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Today, we'll be talking about the FBI, about how J. Edgar Hoover helped launch the rise of white Christian nationalism. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. We talk a lot about Christian nationalism on this show, including our joint report with the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty about Christian nationalism at the January 6th insurrection. We've also interviewed a number of scholars and authors about white Christian nationalism. But one thing that has escaped our notice, and perhaps your notice, is the massive historical role that J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI played in creating and encouraging white Christian nationalism in the early years of the evangelical movement. Our guest today has written a fascinating and alarming book about just that. Lerone A. Martin is the Martin Luther King Jr. Centennial Professor and Director of the Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute at Stanford University. He's the award-winning author of a previous book called Preaching on Wax, The Phonograph and the Shaping of Modern African American Religion. He's co-director of The Crossroads Project advancing public understanding of the history, politics, and cultures of African-American religions. He's working on an adapted graphic novel about the young Martin Luther King to be published by HarperCollins. Professor Martin's newest book, uh, which is just out this year from Princeton University Press, is called The Gospel of J. Edgar Hoover, How the FBI Aided and Abetted the Rise of White Christian Nationalism. Professor Martin is with us uh, from California today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a privilege to be here. I really enjoyed your book. There was so much to learn. There was so much surprising in there about J. Edgar Hoover. We knew he was with the FBI, and we knew there were some shenanigans going on, but I had no idea how deeply religious he was, and the FBI was, and maybe still is today. And um, so what prompted you to write a book like this? Well, I started off uh, thinking I was going to write a book on religious radio. Um, based on the first book that I had looked at, the phonograph, I thought the next logical step would be to write on radio. And two important things happened that really shaped the course of writing this book. The first was um, a coffee with my good friend, uh, William Maxwell. He had just written a book on the FBI's engagement of African-American writers, and he told me that I should probably look at if, if the FBI was surveilling um, African-American radio preachers. So I took that in mind. It was in the summer of 2014. And then two months later, Michael Brown was killed in St. Louis and Ferguson, Missouri, to be exact. And I was living there teaching on the faculty at Washington University in St. Louis, and I met several ministers in the area who had told me that the FBI had reached out to them, um, hoping for partnership, asking for assistance to make sure that Ferguson and the broader St. Louis area did not explode. And so that got me to thinking, you know, how long has the FBI been reaching out to clergy and faith communities for assistance. And so those, those two events, both the conversation with my dear friend, 
William Maxwell and um, the, the aftermath of the killing of Michael Brown and the FBI's engagement with faith communities set me on a path to try to answer this question. What has been the FBI's role in engaging and partnering with faith communities? So you write in your book that J. Edgar Hoover was a white Christian nationalist, that Hoover, and, as you write, Hoover and his FBI set the table upon which white evangelicals feasted. You write that the FBI had a mission that was synonymous with white Christian nationalism. Tell us more about that. J. Edgar Hoover uh, was a Christian, and he believed that America was founded as a Christian nation. He said as much in several speeches. He believed that America you know, was uh, open to other religions, but America itself was a Christian nation, and that America would only survive and thrive if it continued to be a Christian nation. And for Hoover, that notion of Christianity was very much so centered upon certain ideas about society, that society should be led by the Ten Commandments. In fact, he believed that the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were founded upon the Ten Commandments. So he saw these founding documents as sacred. And he also believed that society was meant to be run by white men and solely by white men who were Christian. And he believed that all other races of people and all other genders were subordinate to white men and would have to always be led by white men. So with these factors, believing that America was founded as an explicit, explicit Christian nation and that the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and the Bible were the founding documents and his narrow understanding of how that played into race, all of this made Hoover a white Christian nationalist. And then he showed it by how he shaped his FBI. And he and Billy Graham were quite cozy back then, weren't they? Yes, Billy Graham and Hoover became very close, especially after J. Edgar Hoover wrote his New York Times bestselling book, Masters of Deceit. And from there, um, Billy Graham and a host of white evangelicals, both from the pulpit to the pew, really lionized Hoover and started recognizing him as a religious authority within the white evangelical movement. So you also write that Hoover saw the Cold War as a religious struggle that pitted Judeo-Christian civilization against the religion of atheistic communism, and that Hoover even linked uh, desegregation with communism. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, for Hoover, um, the Cold War was essentially a spiritual battle. It was existential. It was about saving the soul of America, and that if America was going to maintain its Christianity and to be a Christian nation, it had to fight off all foreign ideologies. And for Hoover, that included socialism, communism, or anything he saw as challenging conservative white Christian norms. And that included desegregation. Hoover believed that all efforts to change American society from what it was, the status quo, was always influenced by evil forces. And for Hoover, that evil was actually personified in the devil. He often talked about fighting off the evils or the devil of communism or desegregation. So for Hoover, this was all wrapped into one. There was no basic sociological um, um, answer for crime or uh, sociological answer for white supremacist violence. It always was a spiritual solution that the answer was always America needed to go back to its founding documents and to replicate America as it was at the founding, meaning it should be led by white men, it should be overwhelmingly heterosexual, and it should be a segregated society. And you also write in your book that the founders of modern white evangelicalism preached that American politics needed Christian piety and traditional morality, while, on the other hand, their political practice was marked by the gospel of amoral pragmatism, as you say, and abusive yes. power in the, in the name of Jesus. So he talked about violence, but he seemed to act the violence. How did, how did J. Edgar Hoover fit into this whole picture? 
Hoover really believed that the FBI was America's front guard and final adjudicator of what the nation should be. So Hoover believed that American citizens should never engage in violence, but his, but his FBI, of course, he saw as being exempt from those ideas. And so Hoover believed that his bureau was empowered by God. He said as much in several speeches and also to addresses to employees that they were God's army. He says, in fact, that it is the FBI's job to perpetuate America's Christian endowment. That's a quote from Hoover. And so he saw that purpose and that mission to justify whatever means he wanted to use. And that included illegal surveillance. It included using violence. It included breaking into office buildings and, and stealing documents and included anything that Hoover believed was necessary in order to maintain his understanding of America as a white Christian nation. To elaborate on that, you said that uh, the FBI saw themselves as protecting democracy, but not practicing democracy. Yes, you know, Hoover, it's, it's fascinating in that the way that white evangelicals gravitate towards Hoover and the way that they embrace J. Edgar Hoover as a leader and adjudicator of their movement. It's fascinating because Hoover himself never ever claimed to be to be an evangelical, right? This is where the definition of white Christian nationalism is so important. I know that you've had some some of uh, folks on your show who, whose work I admire, um, including uh, Seth Perry. And one of the things we learned from their research is that white Christian nationalism is not so much concerned about theological particulars. There's not going to be a great deal of debate within white Christian nationalist circles about soteriology or what it means to be saved or communion or what it means to understand the Holy Ghost or pneumatology. The major concerns are primarily about ideas around society and, and whiteness and uh, white supremacy. And so that's how Hoover was able to become a leader of the evangelical movement even though he himself was not an evangelical and never, ever claimed to be born again. But that's what I mean when I say that this, 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 this political norm within white evangelicalism of practicing extreme pragmatism, even as it preached a certain kind of Christian piety. So Hoover was, a, you know, speaking of his religion, he was a committed Presbyterian, but then he went on to kind of embraced the American Catholic Church and the Jesuits, didn't he? He did. Hoover saw within the, the Catholic Church something that he greatly admired. He joined a number of individuals in the 19th century that while there was still anti-Catholicism in America that was wrapped up in, of course, anti-immigrant um, rhetoric, Hoover still saw something within the Catholic Church that he believed was useful as in its fight against communism. He saw the Catholic Church and the parish structure, with both being the church and the school being so closely related to one another, he saw that as something that Protestants should mimic. In fact, in 1939, he gave a famous speech where he said, I am a Protestant, but I recognize the Catholic Church as being the greatest weapon against communism in this country. So Hoover saw the Catholics as being structured in a way that he thought America especially American Protestants, should structure American society writ large. And he really loved the Jesuits primarily because of the Jesuit founding by St. Ignatius of Loyola, who was a former soldier who had then turned over his sword to Christ and founded a religious movement that was about masculinity, about being worldly, about being engaged in society. Hoover saw the Jesuit model as something he wanted his agents to follow. And so he instituted Jesuit spiritual retreats for his FBI agents to go through as a way to cultivate this idea of being a soldier for Christ. Yeah, that's one of the fascinating parts about your book was the FBI, at least back then, maybe today, was almost like a church. They had to pray, they had masses, they had uh, these retreats that they went on, uh, these, these, these white Christian uh, special agents we're really almost attending church. Uh, is it still like that? The Bureau had a whole suite of uh, worship services. And from what I can tell, 
Um, the Bureau continued to do that even after J. Edgar Hoover's death in 1972. In fact, during the 70s, the FBI invited and hosted twice the recently deceased Pat Robertson, the founder of the 700 Club. He was invited to preach at the FBI worship service. From what I can see within news reports and what the FBI has released, the Bureau does still have worship services. In fact, um, recently in this year in Chicago, the Chicago field office, um, for the first time um, for their worship service on Ash Wednesday, had the priest not come to FBI headquarters in Chicago for Ash Wednesday, but allowed agents time off to go to church on Ash Wednesday to receive ashes from a local Catholic priest. And from my understanding and from news reports, that is the first time in decades where the Bureau has not had a priest in the Chicago field office come for Ash Wednesday. So that gives us a bit of an insight that the Bureau does still have a religious culture within it and that it still has religious practices that maybe are not as formalized as when Hoover was in office, but certainly is still ingrained within the broader culture of the FBI. We're speaking with Professor Lerone Martin about his fascinating new book, The Gospel of J. Edgar Hoover, How the FBI Aided and Abetted the Rise of White Christian Nationalism. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening, but the religious pushback is fierce and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name is Bill, and I'm an out-of-the-closet apatheist meaning I don't really care what you believe, and I don't really think that you should care what I believe. I was raised in South Dakota in a strict Catholic family. I was an altar boy. I served Mass a lot of Sundays twice. We ha the, the priest gave us this little card that said, in case of accident, please call a priest. I don't really like that idea anymore since I left the church about 40 years ago. Now, if you find me, Alongside the road after an accident, please call an ambulance and an EMT. And welcome back to Free Thought Matters. We're continuing our conversation with Professor Lerone Martin about his exceptional new book, The Gospel of J. Edgar Hoover, How the FBI Aided and Abetted the Rise of White Christian nationalism. So in your book, you write that there were rumors that even though the FBI was very anti-gay, there might have been rumors about Hoover himself. Yeah, there were, have been a great deal of rumors uh, about Hoover's sexuality, both during his time as FBI director and also since his death. And those rumors arise from the fact that Hoover never married. Um, he lived at home with his mother until he was 43 years old when his mother died in 1938. And Hoover had a male associate who was the second in charge of the FBI, a man by the name of Clyde Tolson, who also was never married. And the two worked together for over 30 years. And during that process of working together for 30 years, they had lunch together every day. They had dinner together every evening, rotating from Hoover's house to Tolson's house. They rode to work together every day. They vacationed together every summer. And when Hoover died, he left his home to Clyde Tolson. And then at Hoover's funeral, when the flag was taken off of uh, Hoover's coffin, it was folded up and given to Clyde Tolson. So in many ways, Hoover and Clyde really did function as domestic, what we would call today domestic partners. Whether or not they were ever physically romantic, 
is something that the historian will never fully know. There have been rumors and interviews with people who claim they've seen this, but those uh, reports are questionable. But what we do have evidence of is this intimate, close relationship these two men shared with one another for more than 30 years. And so they really did function as domestic partners. Which she really yet, shouldn't matter, should it? It shouldn't matter, except that, that he was so, he, he made the FBI so homophobic, yeah, correct? the hypocrisy. Correct. I think, I think that's what some people have seen is maybe perhaps what motivated Hoover's uh, war on uh, gay brothers and sisters in this country was that he perhaps maybe was hiding something. That we don't know, but we do know that there was indeed um, an assault against queer, uh, the queer community in this country under Hoover's watch. And, uh, and you've talked a little bit about the racism, but could we talk more about the racism and sexism that, that Hoover inaugurated? Absolutely. When Hoover took over as FBI director in 1924, and he served in that role for almost half of a century, he, didn't, he died in office in 1972. During that 48-year period, he got rid of all special agents who were women in the Department of Justice. And also, get, uh, he got rid of all the individuals of color who had functioned as special agents. And he instituted within the Bureau hiring almost exclusively white Protestant and white Catholic men. And again, as we said earlier, having them go through uh, r religious uh, worship services to cultivate this idea of a spiritual soldier and as a minister. And he continued that hiring practice until, under the Kennedy administration, he was forced to begin to hire African-American agents. And he hired two African-American agents in 1962 um, to serve in the FBI. And slowly but surely, he had roughly two African-American agents in every sp uh, special agent class following that until his death. Women were not permitted to be special agents in the FBI until after Hoover died. And almost immediately after his death, the FBI began hiring women as special agents within the FBI. And the fascinating thing is that when those African-American agents were hired, there were always usually two, and they were always, even at training, they were segregated and always were made to room together, even at special training class. Wow. And those African-American agents were also given special employee ID numbers so that the Bureau would never have to put in a special agent's file this is a Negro officer, or excuse me, or a Negro special agent. All superiors would know by the fact that the, the number of the FBI employee's identification uh, uh, calling card, which always started with a nine, which was one way for the FBI to tip off who was an African-American agent, who was a white agent. Wow. And that, of course, controlled promotion, controlled appointments and things of that nature. Another fascinating chapter in your book, which I really enjoyed, is about Christianity Today, the magazine Christianity Today, which was founded by Billy yes. Graham. And you, in your book, mm -hmm. you write that Billy Graham, if Billy Graham was America's pastor, J. Edgar Hoover was America's bishop. Tell us more about that yes. Christianity Today thing. Christianity Today was a magazine founded after World War II by uh, Billy Graham and a host of other white evangelicals. And it rose to prominence in part by off of the pen of J. Edgar Hoover. Um, Christianity Today began asking Hoover to write essays for the magazine. And as a result, the magazine gained in popularity to the point where people began writing the FBI, asking Hoover for copies of these essays. The FBI would stamp these essays with the Department of Justice insignia and then send them out across the country to people who wanted them, including pastors and parishioners, to the point where FBI agents began noticing that pastors across the country began reading Hoover's essays from Christianity Today in the pulpit mm -hmm. as their sermons. And then parishioners were then writing Hoover asking for spiritual advice and guidance. They bypassed their pastors, they bypassed their deacons, and began writing and flooding the FBI with questions about spiritual guidance around prayer, around which Bible they should read, around who they should listen to on the radio or watch on television. So in that sense, Hoover really did begin to function as a bishop, as an adjudicator for the white evangelical faith community. So it really was the gospel according to J. Edgar Hoover, and you've called it a tax-supported ministry even. 
We're almost out of time, but in 1973, there was some important papers published that kind of overthrew a lot of this. What was that? Um, there was uh, the publication of the COINTELPRO papers, and this was a group of citizens, a group of religious folks, Protestants, Catholics, and Jews who got together, broke into an FBI field office in Media, Pennsylvania in 1971, discovered some documents that showed the FBI was doing what many Americans expected they were doing all along, which was spying on American citizens, not for criminal activity, but simply policing political and religious thought. When those documents were released by the court and published, known as the counterintelligence papers or the COINTELPRO papers, it finally gave America evidence that the Bureau was actually doing what uh, many Americans had thought they were doing all along. That changed the way white evangelicals orientated themselves to Hoover. He was scrubbed from their history. He was not talked about any longer. And then the, FB, then the, the white evangelical movement really then began to move on from Hoover and began looking for another political champion. And that, of course, is a tradition that has continued today within the white evangelical movement. But briefly, the legacy continues, doesn't it? The legacy does continue. This idea of finding a white Christian champion, regardless of their stated priorities and pieties, seems to continue. Um, it seems as if in the 80s, it was Ronald Reagan, and it seemed uh, um, now what we have today, of course, is with Donald Trump, who Presbyterian, like Hoover, never claimed to be born again, doesn't even really know the Bible very well. But yet, because of his commitment to white Christian nationalism, white evangelicals we know have really surrounded him with support and have looked to him to be their political champion. And in many ways, this is a tradition we could see that started from the very beginning of white evangelicalism, and the person they turned to from the very beginning was J. Edgar Hoover. Well, thank you for writing the book, The Gospel of J. Edgar Hoover, and thank you for being with us today, Professor. It was a, it was a blessing and a privilege to be here. Thank you for having me. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because Free Thought Matters. I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.